Um, it, we have been talking about this series on Restored, and we do the same thing in Kidsmen, in our Kidsmen group in the back that we do in church here every week. And so kids, I'm going to need help by way of recap. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about that even when we mess up, Yes! I like it how you were ready. For those of you who weren't in Kidsmen, we can throw this up on the screen so you can read along. Even when we mess up, God helps. Right? And every, kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need a little bit more out of you. You've got to anchor it for us because these old people don't know how to do it. Right? Okay? And, and we learned that even when things go wrong, God helps. See? Ready for it. And, and this week we're going to be talking about something similar. We're going to talk about how even when families fight, God helps. One, one more time. Even when families fight, God helps. And, and I know it seems maybe a little bit too simplistic, but o- over the past few weeks, we've been talking about how God has the ability to restore our relationships. And we've been in this difficult book of Genesis. I, I don't know if you've felt this, but Genesis starts to push some of the boundaries of what we want to get from Scripture. Like, the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah become very difficult books or very difficult stories because a lot of times what we look for in scripture is moral instruction or good teachings or people who we can follow after. And sometimes what you find in scripture is just that it's a book of people interacting with God. And those people are often just as messy as we are. Like the Bible is anything but just basic instructions before leaving earth. Like, sometimes the people in this book are are pretty morally questionable. Sometimes they do good things, and sometimes they do bad things, and sometimes when they do bad things, they get rewarded, and sometimes when they do bad things, they get punished, and and it just feels like, and I'm sure you've realized this already when you read the Bible, is that people in the Bible are messy people in tension, just like we are. And we're going to read about one of those people today, a guy named Jacob. And, and Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. He is uh, the second son of his father Isaac and the more loved son of his mother, which, you know, has its own issues. And, and nearing the end of his dad's life, his dad asked for soup. Look, I don't know why he asked for soup. Like, if I got one meal left in earth, it's not going to be soup. But his dad asked for soup, and he calls his son Esau along like, oh, I want that special soup with wild game. This feels like the worst soup, but fine. And so Esau goes out to go hunting to go get some wild game for the soup, and, and the mother has overheard this promise, and she and Jacob make this little plan that they're going to trick the father into giving him the soup to get the blessing. And so through this like major soup caper, Jacob brings this soup and pretends to be his brother by dressing up in different clothes and making himself smell different so that he can get the blessing from his father. And he receives this blessing that's like, Everything in the earth is going to be yours and people are going to serve you. And so he gets this blessing and he goes away. And then Esau, who's just like spent the day hunting to try and make his dad's favorite soup, comes back like, I got you soup, dad. And, and, and Isaac in this moment realizes that he's been tricked, that something has gone wrong. And, and, and he, sa- he tells this to Esau and Esau's like, well, is there anything left for me? Like, is, the, is there anything left that I can have? And, and the dad's basically like, nah. There's, there's, there's nothing left. Like, you're going to have a hard life, and you're going to serve your brother. Like, that's, the, that's, that's what he's able to give his brother under the... And Esau gets so angry that he says he's going to kill his brother. And if I'm being honest, I can kind of understand that, right? <laughs> like, like this, this Jacob guy doesn't come off as a good guy. Like, he lies to his dying father to steal his brother's inheritance. This is legitimately like one of the worst things I can think of. Like there's, there's layers of how awful this action is. He's not just lying to someone. He's lying to a blind person. And that blind person is not just any, like he's lying to a dying person. And that dying person is his father. Like this person is really vulnerable. And Jacob is lying to them to get what he wants. And this is going to be one of his last interactions with his father on earth. Like this is a deeply despicable act. And it's not just that he's stealing from his brother. Like, it's not like he just w- walked over and stole $5 from his wallet. Like, he stole his inheritance, leaving his brother with nothing. This, again, is like a deeply wicked act, and Jacob knows what he's doing, and he runs away from his angry brother to keep from getting murdered. And sometimes, frustratingly, God goes with him. He actually receives this blessing. And I would imagine that none of you have ever done anything approaching this. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but, but most of us probably haven't lied to our dying father to steal our brother's inheritance. 
But part of the way that families work is that we hurt each other. Like, we do things to our families that can cause deep and lasting hurt or anger. And, and there is something about families that needs God's help. And we know that when families fight, oh, kids, men, table, I need more out of you. We know that when families fight, and that's what we're going to read about today. In this passage, when Jacob is, is called back to the land that his angry brother, his brother that he thinks wants to kill him, lives in. And he sends messengers to see what's happening. And this is what we read in Genesis chapter 32. It says this, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you with 400 men that are with him. And you can imagine this is a scary moment, right? And in great fear and distress, Jacob divides the people who are with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. And he thought, well, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that's left may escape. And then Jacob prays. And he prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and to your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers and their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This is the word of the Lord. And after Jacob prays this prayer, he does. He, he breaks his party up into groups. And it's not just this two groups to ensure that he doesn't get attacked. What he does is he breaks his, his, his camp up into groups and he starts sending groups ahead with like a bunch of camels and, and a bunch of livestock and a bunch of gifts. And, and he starts sending these big groups of people to Esau as if he's, he can give him these gifts and it'll make Esau not mad at him. Like Jacob legitimately says this. He says, I will pacify him with these gifts, end quote. Like, he knows that his brother is mad, and he tries to make it better by giving him something. And I can't help but think, that's not how relationships work. Like, if you hurt someone, and you give them gifts to make it better, that's not a gift, that's a bribe. Like, that, like if someone hurts you, and they don't apologize, they just give you gifts to pacify you, like, that's not a good thing. That's not how relationships work. And, and I understand, like, maybe if you apologize and you give a gift along with it to really make sure the other person knows that you mean it, like, that I can understand. But when you don't apologize and you just give gifts and you're like, hey, are we good? No, we're not good. Like, that doesn't fix it. And it makes it even worse that the gifts he gives are the direct result of the blessing he stole. This is as if I took 100 bucks from my brother, and when my brother was angry, I was like, hey, here's 50. We good? <laughs> no! Like, we're not good. That's not how relationships work. Like, if you steal $100 from me, and you don't apologize, and you just give me a smaller amount, that doesn't fix anything. And, and, and he gives these gifts. When I read it, it's partially because he knows that he did something wrong. This feels equally like trying to pacify his brother, and trying to like ease his own guilt over the things that he did. Why, like, oh no, I was nice. I gave him some good gifts. But th that's not how relationships work. You don't make things better. You don't be friends again. You don't fix hurts by giving gifts and not apologizing. And then being like, we good? Like, no, we're not good. And this guy, Jacob, as you read his story, he does a lot of things wrong. But what he does do right is he prays. And he spends this moment in prayer because he knows what we know. Kids, men, be ready. He knows what we know, that when families fight, but, and so he goes to God in prayer, and, and he is afraid of his brother killing him and killing his friends and his family and his spouses and his kids. Like, this guy is deeply afraid, and he's like, save me, God, from my brother. I am unworthy of everything you've ever given to me. And if you know anything about Jacob, that is like the understatement of the century. Like he is unworthy of everything God has given to him, and yet he prays for one more thing. And it, it, it shows me one of the things that I love about God, that he doesn't answer prayers based on worthiness. Like when you ask for something, he doesn't check your credit with him to see if you can earn that thing. Like, if you pray, he doesn't check your naughty nice list and be like, well, I heard you swear under your breath the other day, and I know it was under your breath, but I'm God, so I heard it, so prayer denied. 
Like, if you, if you pray for healing within your family, he's like, well, you as a family haven't read your Bible enough recently, so no. Like, God doesn't answer prayers based on credit. If you pray good prayers and he desires to, he answers and gives from those prayers. And we know that when families fight, there it is, kids, man. Appreciate it. But what God does is even more than Jacob even asked for. All Jacob asked for is that his brother wouldn't kill him that he would be saved from his brother. And yet, when his brother finally approaches after receiving gift upon gift that Esau like, doesn't even want, we read this. It says, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And Esau looked up and saw the women and the children. He says, who are these with you? And, and Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant." Jacob prays that his brother would no longer be angry enough to kill him, and what ends up happening is his brother runs to him and throws his arms around him and hugs him and embraces him and restores them to this relationship of friendship. And then he looks around, he's like, who are these women and children? And Jacob's like, oh, those are your sisters-in-law and your nieces and nephews. Like, like, that's your family now. And you can just imagine this joyous moment of like being brought back together, and it all happens because Esau doesn't come back and try and play the blame game. You guys know the blame game, right? Anyone is a parent in this room? How many times have you heard your kids fighting, and when you walked in the room, it was just, he did this, she did this, he did this, she did this, and you're supposed to sort it out for who was actually the more and the wrong. Kids in the room, how many times have you gotten in a fight with your brother or sister, and then your parent walked in the room, and you tried to army like all of what you had, all of your ammunition to show that it was actually your brother or sister's fault and not yours? Have you done this before? Okay. I appreciate that some of you are honest, honest enough to say that you do. We do. Like, we're like, oh, well, she touched me first. He was in my space. They touched my phone. He, he, play, he pushed the button on my video game. Like, they knocked over my block tower. Like, we all do this. And, it, and it's gone back in history to the first story we read two weeks ago when, when God confronts Adam, and Adam plays this exact same blame game with God. Adam's like, the woman that you gave me made me do it. And you just and you're like, oh, Adam, that's a rookie mistake. You hate to see it. But, but we do this. We try and do anything we can to show that we are the victims and the other person is the bad guy. And it's a total trap when we try to do this. Parents, you know it's a trap. Trying to sort out which one of your kids was more in the wrong when your kids are fighting is always a trap. It, it doesn't work. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't fix anything. And, and, and we have this tendency, when we feel like someone has wronged us, to want to hold on to that grudge and be like, they don't deserve for me to forgive them. Well, no, they don't. That's what forgiveness is. Like, they, they don't deserve, I, I, I didn't deserve to have that done to me. No, you didn't. But there's only one issue with this blame game is that holding on to grudges and holding on to hurt doesn't make your life any better. And we talked about this actually at Wednesday night at youth group when we talked about how Christians are people who love mercy, drawing from a passage in Micah. And we talked about how hard it is to hold on to grudges. So sometimes grudge holding comes easy, but sometimes grudge holding is like legitimately a work in and of itself. Like you can have a full-time job of grudge holding on to. Like, like there are times when someone who you're angry at tells a good joke or does something that's fun or funny, and you've done this, right? You've started to smile and then remember that actually you're angry at that person. And you have like clenched your jaw so that you can still, has anyone done this? Because you knew that you were angry at that person and you didn't want to forgive them. Like holding on to a grudge doesn't make your life any better. Even when that person, the other person is actually in the wrong. Even when that other person has actually done a deeply wicked and despicable thing, and this is a story about a person who's actually done a deeply wicked and despicable thing. Jacob lied to his dying father to steal from his brother. And yet what we find is that Esau does the hard work of letting go, of not holding on to grudges and not holding on to hurt. And that is work that God is always, always, always willing to join us in. Like our God is in the forgiveness business. And, and we don't read anything about Esau in the intervening years between when the blessing was stolen from him and when they meet up again. Like, we don't see Esau at all, but I can promise you that a lot went down in that time. 
that there were probably long nights where Esau cursed his brother for what he'd done to him. Like there were probably days when it felt like everything was going wrong and it was like if it weren't for my backstabbing brother, my life would be better. There were probably times when he stayed up late talking to his spouse about his feelings over this thing. There were probably times when he received good advice that offered him perspective. There were probably days as he began to heal that he reminded himself of the good things about his brother and why he loved him. There were probably times when he spent time in prayer unpacking his feelings and emotions and hurt with God to receive this healing of letting go of the grudge. Like, we don't read anything about those years, but I can tell you with 100% certainty that that was a time that Esau worked through a lot of things with God and that God provided him the help he needed to let go. That, that, like, that's the hard work of forgiveness. And again, you guys have done this before, right? That hard work of forgiveness that can, that can take literal years to do. And, and this is the opposite of the kind of, I'm sorry, it's fine type of forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness that just denies that anything actually hurt or anything actually went wrong. No, this is real forgiveness. That, that actually acknowledges that there was real hurt and real wrongdoing, and it's going to take real time to recover from. Like, it's going to actually take effort to restore us from. And, and, and that's... If you're anything like me, that's a difficult type of forgiveness to do. Because if you're anything like me, you were taught that as soon as someone apologizes, you need to accept that apology and it's done with. Like as soon as someone apologizes, it's supposed to be over with, but sometimes even when someone apologizes, the hurt lingers. And it can take time to deal with that hurt and let go of the pain and the, and the grudges. But that's work that God is active in that he is the one who can work along with you to soften your heart to this. And and it makes me wonder if this prayer that Jacob prays of save me from my brother is actually mirrored by prayers that Esau prayed over the years of, Lord, help me forgive my brother. Like I said, we don't read anything about the intervening years, but the way that God works is not by force or bribery to pacify people, but by through, through the long work and internal work of forgiveness and letting go. And even at the end of all this, when they meet up, Jacob still doesn't apologize. And it makes me so mad when I read this story. Like, I don't know if that gets you. It really gets me. Like, I want Jacob, one of the, like, fathers of our faith. Like, he gets a name of patriarch, which feels like you're pretty important if people call you a patriarch. And yet, at the end of this, he still doesn't apologize for what he did. Like maybe they hang out later on and there's a conversation where Jacob apologizes, but like I get, like honestly, I don't think that he does. And, And I find myself being very frustrated with Jacob because it's not fair. Like this story is not fair. Esau should not have to forgive his brother for lying to his dying dad and stealing his blessing. It's not fair that Jacob doesn't apologize And the more I read this story, the more I realize that the person I want to learn from isn't Jacob, it's Esau. Because he recognizes that he can't control what someone else does. He can only control what he does. He can't make his brother not hurt him. He can't make his brother apologize. He can only control how he reacts. And so he does the hard work with God to let go of that hurt. And sometimes an apology can diffuse the hurt that exists when you hurt somebody. And and that's something you can control when you hurt someone. You can swallow your pride and and actually give that apology. But sometimes someone hurt you and you can't make them be sorry. You can't make them apologize. And sometimes forgiving, even when the other person hasn't apologized, can be what's needed to restore conversations so that hard conversations can happen. Like sometimes you are in a fight with your brother and it hurts deep. Sometimes you maybe got yelled at by your parent and it hurts deep. Sometimes it feels like your kids are rebelling against you or your spouse has lied to you and it hurts deep and that takes time for that to heal. But when I look at Esau, he is not so concerned with what the other person is doing as the position of his own heart. And he knows that holding on to grudges doesn't make his life any better. And so he does that hard work of forgiveness alongside God and God frees him from the burden that grudges are. And our God is in the mercy business. Like, that's what he does. This story looks almost exactly like a story later in Scripture of the prodigal son, where a person 
it's a story that Jesus tells about our relationship with God where a person just wants their inheritance from their father as if to say, I wish you were dead, I just want your money. And he goes and squanders all that money and he comes back and when he comes back, before he can say anything, his father embraces him and is excited to have him home. Like, that is our relationship to God and Jesus, is that when we rebelled against him, before we even apologized, he was ready to welcome us home. And I find in this story Esau doing something that is so Jesus-shaped. Like, it so looks like exactly what Jesus does. And, and any time we are offering mercy, it is something that is Jesus-shaped, because that's what he does. He offers mercy and forgiveness, and, and that forgiveness is oftentimes essential for families sometimes especially for families, especially if you spent two years under the same roof not being allowed to go outside because you were worried about getting sick. Like, we got on each other's nerves, didn't we? Like, we said things that hurt in anger, didn't we? And, and maybe you come here today still bearing some of the weight of things that your family has said to you or done to you. Maybe when you go to sleep, sometimes you still hear some of the words that your sibling or your parent has said to you. Maybe you still have an estrangement with a, with a relative for something they've done. Maybe you're still wrestling through the fact that a spouse has lied to you about something and you don't know what to do with that. And I'm not here to tell you that these complex circumstances are simple and you just need to offer forgiveness and it'll solve it, because it won't. Like sometimes things are so messy or hurts are so egregious that the solution isn't being friends again. I get that. But what I learned from Esau is that I can't control what someone else does. I can't control if they hurt me. I can't control if they're sorry for it. I can only control what I do. And holding on to grudges doesn't make my life any better. And what I learned from God is that if I am lurking, looking to offer mercy, if I am looking to offer forgiveness, that is something that is Jesus-shaped. Like that is a work that God is always willing to join me in because I have been forgiven and forgiven and forgiven again and he is so excited when I can offer that forgiveness to someone else, even when they don't deserve it, even when they don't apologize, even when it's not fair. Whenever I can free someone else from the burdens that they bear of their guilt because it also frees me from the burden that I bear from my grudges. Like it, it may sound too simple when I break it down into kids' terms, but it's exceedingly true. Kids, man. Be ready. Even when families fight. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are the one who helps us. Lord, as we do the difficult work ahead of letting go of hurt, of letting go of grudges, of restoring relationships, I pray that you would be the one at work in our hearts and in the hearts of others. Lord, to soften our callousness. Lord, make us be the people who serve you well and do things that are shaped like you. That our families and our friends might see your actions through us. In your name we pray. Amen.